And welcome back to the Clinical Athlete Podcast. If you're not familiar with Clinical Athlete, we're a network of healthcare providers, coaches, trainers, and students who specialize in the management of athletes. You can find your nearest Clinical Athlete provider at clinicalathlete.com. We also have a forum where clinicians, coaches, trainers, and students network, discuss, and share ideas and resources related to sports med, athlete rehab, and performance. So to join the forum or for for a potential listing on the Clinical Athlete Directory and for all upcoming seminars, webinars, events, details can be found on the clinicalathlete.com website. And a quick, quick plug, we just launched our first online continuing education course in the Clinical Athlete Forum uh, within the Clinical Athlete Academy, and it is by our very own Jared Maynard, and it's titled Pain Science and What You Need to Know. And we're super, super excited about that. So for uh, you can earn CEU credit for certain professions, and, and it's really good stuff. So we're going to have a lot more courses just like that. This podcast can be found on that website as well, along with YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. My name is Quinn Hennick. I'm a doctor of physical therapy in Orange County, California at Clinical Athlete Newport. I'm joined by the aforementioned Jared Maynard, who is a clinical athlete continuing education coordinator and a physiotherapist himself at King Physiotherapy and Foot Clinic in Ontario, Canada. What's up, Jared? Not much, man. Just chilling because it's cold in Canada. What's the temperature there? <laughs> uh, I think it's like minus. I don't know. I don't know if it's in the negative double digits, but it's cold enough. Oh, God. Yeah, <laughs> me and Mel are in that? Southern California. No. I, well, no, I mean, I grew I up in Indiana, <laughs> so I I grew up in the four seasons. We got we got all the seasons where I so I'm used to it. I just prefer not to ever have to experience it again. You just different. forsaken two of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like seasons. I just I just you know stay with the good ones. Uh, we're, we're also joined by a very special guest, Doctor Melissa Davis. Melissa holds a PhD in neurobiology and behavior and has 10 years of research experience. Her work has been featured in Scientific American and published in high impact peer reviewed journals. She has made a lifelong scientific hobby of studying sports science and is a lifelong athlete and scholar. Melissa is currently a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt under Jiva Santana at One Jiu Jitsu and is a multiple time IBJJF master world champion. She has also represented the United States in the International Abu Dhabi World Pro Competition on multiple occasions, and she has experience with physique competition, distance running, and dance as well. Her specialty is helping clients learn to effectively utilize the tools she gives them to lose fat, gain muscle, and perform, and she is a valued uh, member of the Renaissance Periodization staff. So basically, she's a double PhD badass. Mel, thanks so much for being on the show. How are you? I'm doing really well. A little cold, but other than that, oh doing man, okay. Jared's laughing about that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything. It she is said, a little like chilly. Below sixty right now. <laughs> oh. Keep talking. You know, it's like a desert, so it gets kind of chilly at night. I have to like, oh, I have a, I have a long sleeve shirt behind me, so if I need yeah, it, I have it's a going on. In case. Yeah, there you go. God bless you. <laughs> so. Mel's doing a webinar for us in a few days, and it's titled Interpreting Scientific Data for Personal Application Plus Realistic Psychological Strategies for Adherence to Diet and Training Programs. There's a lot there. We could break that down into probably five webinars just with that title alone. So we wanted to get you on the show to start to dive into those topics a little bit. But before we go too deep there, can you talk a little bit about what got you interested in these topics and ultimately what led you through your to your career path and, and to culminate in the pinnacle, which is sharing your story with our six listeners on the Clinical Athlete Podcast? <laughs> yeah, definitely. So I, um, as you mentioned, I have a PhD in neurobiology and behavior, and uh, I was really I just loved science. I loved the way you could test hypotheses and find out truths and things like that. And I obviously studied the brain, but I was also an athlete. So at some point during my PhD, I had this epiphany that you could apply science to other parts of life. And I sort of started diving into the science of uh, sport and nutrition. And um, I became obsessed with it because it was not only science, which I love, but it was applicable science that I could apply to my life and improve my Um, athletic pursuits with. So I just sort of got fascinated. And as time went on, I 
spent more and more time in that and less became less and less interested in uh, brain research and just had the opportunity to start with RP and the rest is history. When did you start with RP? It's been a while uh, now, right? almost five years ago. Yeah. Wow. Four and a half or so. Yeah. Do you find that even though you kind of went away from you know brain research specifically, that that has helped you with what you're doing, just kind of like understanding people in a way? Oh, yeah, a hundred percent. I think my the sort of background and learning and memory has made me a better coach for sure, because I can kind of apply the concepts I learned about how humans change their behavior to the diet and training programs. I mean, that's why sure. we talk about diet and exercise. That's behavior. Yeah, that's, exactly. That's all it is, right? And yeah. within that, the first part of your webinar is going to talk about understanding scientific literature. And can you maybe talk about if you're somebody who doesn't necessarily, maybe they do have a background, maybe they don't, but they at least know that it's difficult for them to sift through all of the information that's on the internet. Right. Instagram, you know, is, is right in front of their yeah. face. And, and on the flip side, the latest systematic review and meta analysis is maybe difficult to filter right. uh, and to understand in that capacity. So yeah, fitness uh, memes are definitely easier to digest than totally. scientific articles, arrows and such, and, and those types of things. How do you start to educate somebody where to look and what to look for in regards to analyzing science? Okay, so first, I think kind of a meta topic of the webinar is going to be um, how deep do you dive into anything in life, whether it's a research or a training program or a nutrition program, and sort of the idea that if you are just learning to swim, don't go free diving in the ocean with sharks kind of thing. You want to wade in. So the same with reading science. If you're brand new to nutrition, and, or if you're brand new to science in general and you want to know more, more about nutrition and training, I think the best place to start is a textbook. And then once you have a nice fundamental knowledge base, then you can start sort of dipping into the science. Because the thing is, if you're going to PubMed and searching something, the fundamentals are very rarely researched anymore because they're fundamentals. They've been established and everyone agrees upon them and they're in textbooks and the only scientific articles about them are, you know, 30 years old and they're going to be harder to come by. Um, and any recent articles are going to be researching like tiny little details that might not apply to your needs yet as a brand new, um, someone who's brand new into science and fitness. Um, once you feel like you have a good fundamental knowledge base, I think then you can start looking at primary articles. And I'd say my best mini tip for that is first thing you do, look at the subjects that were used. So it's particularly for training. Make sure that the subjects you're looking at apply or will um, the subjects you're planning to apply the information to match the subjects in the study. I think people gloss over we, t we call it abstract hunting where right. you'll yeah. read, yeah, you'll read maybe the introduction to the article. You'll read the, you'll, you'll read the article title. you will be like, oh, this applies to what I want it to apply to. Right. And then you'll go straight to the conclusion in the abstract and you'll gloss over all of the methods. And right. that sounds exactly. like, yeah, it sounds like that's kind of what you're getting at is you got to look at, is, does the patient population apply? Is it, is it externally valid to what you're even right. asking? Um, so as an example, so one thing to keep in mind too, is when, um, as a researcher, you know, that if you want to get your stuff published, you need a sexy title. So a lot of times the title and the abstract are going to be much sexier than the actual data and conclusions. So when you're seeing that, know that the researchers chose that title to get attention to their paper and get it actually published. So if you're, for example, if you're training, like older women who have been in weight training for 10 years and you find a conclusion based on untrained college age males, you're going to have radically different results in that population than you will in the one you're looking to apply the information to. So just an example of how that can go wrong. Do you also find with, you mentioned the conclusion and the title are going to be more sexy than the actual statistics in some cases. I see mm -hmm. this in research that applies to rehab in that 
The conclusions state that the information was, or the, the data was statistically significant. And mm-hmm. they take that statistical significance and they run with any and all narratives that they want to run with to make right. it sound really important and, and, you know, and big. And so it's like, these are the, you know, the results of this landmark study, this type of thing. But when you actually look at the data, it's like, is that even clinically relevant? You know, it was statistically right. significant. Does it mean anything though? It was such a small effect size or it was a small change or something like that. Do you see that type of thing happen with nutrition research as well? Oh, definitely. Yeah. And you'll see things like, for example, that I don't know if you know about that. There's some cohort studies a while ago associating um, sugar-free sweeteners with obesity. And so their big conclusion was, you know, Splenda causes obesity, which doesn't really make any sense in terms of physics, but they had this really strong association. It was statistically significant. People who were eating Splenda were more likely to be obese. But they sort of in their, I'm not sure if it was a scientist fervor to get published and have, you know, this crazy controversial title or if it was just a, a blind spot for them. But the alternate conclusion, which is obviously makes more sense and more data has come out to support is that people who are obese are eating more sugar-free sweeteners because they're trying to lose weight. So mm. confounding factors that we're getting into. Yeah. Well, and popular media will take that conclusion and, and run oh, with and it. That's run. why that stuff, And they're yeah. still running with it, despite the subsequent literature that came out and said, no, nah, it's probably not quite the case. They did controlled studies where they had people eat, you know, drink sugar, sugar-free sweetener, or plain water, and guess who lost more weight? Yeah. Um, but there, yeah, there's still, Popular News is still publishing that as if it were true. There's been tons uh, of stuff like that. Chocolate cures disease and you know, yeah. eating breakfast, smelling farts, cures <laughs> cancer. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> My favorite. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah. So I want to go back to something you said in regards to the first place to start because we're kind of getting down the rabbit hole of like what's a confounding factor and all these things. But right. you know, if you're somebody that doesn't have that background, at least what you're saying is try to at least match the demographic of the study with the demographic that, yeah. or you, if you're trying to apply it to yourself. Okay, we've got that. In regards to textbooks, do you find any downside? to textbooks in that they're my, my concern with textbooks is that they're biased towards the author because the author's kind of you know, interpretation of whatever they're talking about. And with books, when the book is published, when the book is finally published, it's usually have having stopped been written a year ago or maybe even two oh, yeah. years ago, you know? So it's like the infer- they're already ready to update the, the book and something like that. So do you preface that at all? in regards to weaknesses of even textbooks? Um, There's definitely weaknesses to textbooks, but I think the updates that will be made to a textbook or the changes that happen within a year or two are going to be with regard to details. Like, I doubt there are any textbooks in the last 10 years that say don't eat protein. You know what I'm saying? So if you're really at the start of delving into this information, I think it's still a good place to start recognize that there might be updates to the details or that it might not be completely exact, but that the basics and the fundamentals will give you a good background from which to dive into reading more updated scientific literature with a more skeptical eye. Because if you go straight to PubMed and read, you know, a nutrition article, you might not even have an idea of, you know, what a carbohydrate is or, you know, some basics like that. So it really just depends on where you're coming from and how much, um, fundamentals you're lacking before going into scientific reading. So your thing is the textbook is a nice synopsis of things that are are pretty well established. Like we're not worried about the second edition telling us that protein actually has 12 calories per gram or something like that. Like this, these things are, these things are pretty set in stone. So yeah. 0.8 times body weight versus one times body weight should be eaten, things like that. But you'll just get a general idea and then you can sort of decide for yourself what to believe when you dive into the literature and you can like hone your your view. That makes perfect sense. Getting then into, so let's say we've got, okay, I've read a, read a book or two. I've got a general understanding, a working knowledge of this to some extent. I want to start to dive into some type of papers. Does study type matter? Because I don't know if a lot of people understand that there are different types of study and study designs. Yeah, Absolutely. Where do we go from there and how do we look for that? So 
I would say when you're when you're jumping onto PubMed or Google Google Scholar, however you're going to look for your papers, um, first of all, have a very specific idea of what you want to look up. Unless you are someone who has eternal focus, you can really just dive down a rabbit hole and you know like end up reading something ten steps away from what you started reading when you start searching. Um, which is good. I mean, it's interesting, it's fun. But if you really want an answer to a specific question, think about it, write down some keywords, search those, and really follow the trail. You know, find um, when you do your first search, find a good meta analysis or review. And what that is, for those who don't know, is that's when a scientist in that field has sort of collected as many articles as possible from that field to synthesize what is known about a particular topic. So um, the cool thing about that is not only do you get a bunch of articles and a bunch of conclusions from different scientists in one paper, you also have the benefit of that paper having been vetted by competitors in the field. So the way that um, science publication works in peer-reviewed journals is they send the article into the journal to be published, and then the journal sends it to a bunch of your competitors who want to shoot you down, if at all possible, because they're in competition with you. So if it's been published, that means your competitors have said, you know what, this is pretty good. This is a pretty fair review or analysis of this particular topic. So I think that's a really good place to start. They tend to be a little bit easier to read than a primary article as well. And they also give you a list of primary articles to read for yourself if you're skeptical about one or more conclusions. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I, um, do you agree also, uh, just like always strengths and weaknesses, strengths and weaknesses with these types of things, that with a systematic review or a meta-analysis or both, that garbage in can equal garbage out sometimes. So even though a, synth- a systematic review is a synopsis of all of the available evidence, if the available evidence is not very good, then be, you know, you'd be cautious with the conclusions of the systematic review. Is that fair? Yeah, it definitely, yeah, I think so. I think it depends on, I think for um, nutrition, that tends to be less true. I think the the newer the field, the more likely there's a little garbage in the peer-reviewed journals, just because there's less going on. There's less competition. People are getting things published more easily. I think in the field of nutrition, a review is less likely to have that. Um, I think in sports science, it's more likely just because there's a lot of studies that are done really low power, um, few participants, things like that, and some sort of small sex of bias in that field still. So it's always good. You always have to be skeptical. You always have to think about alternate conclusions. But um, yeah, the newer the field, the more likely that's true. And I think the more established the field, the less likely. Maybe I'll just jump in real quick. Maybe it's prudent to talk about something that uh, people might have been exposed to insofar as differences between, say, levels of evidence versus mm-hmm. the quality of a study that's being done. Can you uh-huh. speak to what those are and how we can start to figure out what's what? What do you mean by levels of evidence? You mean so like, uh, like level one evidence being versus... or I mean like uh, a systematic review or, or meta-analysis being or an RCT uh, as like a, a top level of edit evidence versus like a, a case study or right. something like that. Right. So some of the, um, and I, I guess that plays into the types of study as well. So you can have something like a case study, as you said, which has, they're studying one, one or two people and looking at uh, particular progress in those people. I think that probably happens less, that happens more often in uh, medical research than anything else. But um they, you can get a ton of detail from a study like that, but you don't know how well you can apply it to everyone. So similarly to human studies where there's just a few subjects, um, you can get a lot of detail and a lot of control when you're doing human experimental studies, but you don't know how well you can apply it because it's not a large sample pool. Mm-hmm. Um, there are things like cohort studies and surveys where you the scientists are asking tons and tons of people from all over the place and different, you know, they might set a range of ages and a certain demographic, but you get so much data. The problem with that is that people lie, so you get less detail. So it's really good if you want to believe a conclusion. It's really nice if you can see that they've 
one study has found that in a you know a huge survey study, and this is the conclusion they've come to. And another study has done a controlled trial where they're you know taking humans, asking them to eat or do a certain thing, and then measuring outcomes. And maybe even an animal study or a molecular study where they've said, okay, this is what we think the mechanism. We think this is how this happens. And then that's been confirmed in another study. So the more types of studies you see coming to the same conclusion, the more you can feel good about it. Gotcha. They and all then, have strengths and weaknesses. No, no, right. Sorry. So just to that point then, um, would it be accurate to say that with all of those different types of studies, we they may also be you know well designed or poorly designed, and that too is going to influence what we can take from them and how how readily we can apply the conclusions. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it would be great to think that anything that was published in a peer reviewed journal is well designed, but that's not always the case. So that's I think one of the most important things um, when you're deciding to dive into reading scientific literature is you really need to set aside time. It's not um, it's not like reading a quick blog or an internet meme. It's it's dense literature. It takes a long time. You need to read any one paper. I usually read two or three times before I really feel comfortable that I understand what's going on. And you need to put on your skeptic hat and think about you know how did they do this? Like are there any alternate conclusions? Is there a control that they missed? So. Even just reading a little bit online about the scientific method before doing this is a good idea. It sounds rudimentary, but um, really understanding how controls work so that you can judge whether a good control was used in experimental studies and really thinking about how variables work and conclusions, how conclusions can be drawn um, can be really helpful. Awesome. And yeah, to both your guys' point, you can see examples of the study design versus quality in the history of literature we look at like smoking and cancer all of that data comes from epidemiology they're not randomized controlled yeah. trials of smoking groups and non-smoking groups and then this link but the the numbers were the data was so overwhelming um, the association right. was so strong we can make some pretty strong conclusions you backtrack even further than that with scurvy um and and <laughs> vitamin C deficiency, the, the, the quote unquote research was awful, but it was so clear that like the effects were so strong, then we can make some, some of those conclusions. Um, and then on the flip side, you have this like really great randomized controlled uh, study design. Everything is super spot on, but you have three subjects and you ask 27 questions with 27 right. outcomes. And so you like, basically you're just looking anything and everything so you can your design can be strong, but your methodology can be flawed, and and yeah. vice versa. And the what you the I love the point that you made, Mel, where you can even dive down to animal studies because I think then the people are like, "Wow, you poo poo, oh, it's an animal study, you know, no application to humans." And like, okay, fair, but the argument is efficacy and effectiveness. So we've got to understand mechanisms first. That's very helpful. So in an animal studies, we can, that can help. And then we can transition that to laboratory human studies, hopefully getting the same type of response. And then what you mentioned is like effectiveness. Now we can try to take this to the real world and see how it's actually affecting outcomes in humans in their daily. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a couple things for each type of study that can uh, help increase it or uh, improve it weaknesses. So for example, survey studies, I was just uh, reading about someone post, I think it was Tiago from RP posted a, a really cool study um, showing a link between depression and uh, inflammatory foods. And so what you have here is a really strong link, right? Uh, people who are eating more inflammatory foods are more likely to be depressed. We have a similar problem that we often have with this kind of study, like cause effect chicken egg is it the depression causing them to eat crappy or does eating crappy make them depressed or is there a gene that sits close to another gene and one gene affects depression one affects uh, propensity to crave crappy food so there's all kinds of conclusions you can draw but so a way that that kind of study can sort of improve upon um, its believability is okay can we so to take smoking as an easier example to talk about Let's say that someone wanted to conclude that being healthy caused you to smoke, right? 
But if you do a study showing an increase in health when people quit smoking, a decrease in health when they start smoking, and a general association with bad health and smoking, then you have a lot more convincing of an argument there. It's hard to say. Um, you know which is the chicken, which is the egg, and it's hard to reverse it given all three of those factors. So when you're looking at cohort or survey studies, those sort of directional tests of the data can be helpful. And then when you're looking at experimental studies, you want to see uh, a large group and in size that has enough power to get you know reasonable statistics. Um, that's a little more difficult because you need to have sort of an understanding of statistics before <laughs> you can analyze it. But I would say in the last, if the study's been published in the last 10 years, chances are no one let it slide through with horrible statistics in most cases. So um, larger in sizes tend to be better for, for experimental studies. There's another big point that you uh, threw out there. Not only, okay, so we've got, if we if we back up to the person who understands like 5% of what you're saying because they don't have this background. Then we've got match the sample, match the sample of the population. But also you mentioned alternative conclusions or alternative right. hypotheses, aka how else could we have explained these results other than the right. way that the researchers explain them? And that is such an important thing because you don't need statistical background or you don't need to be a PhD right. to try to come up with different explanations like your example of depression and uh you know crappy diet there's other you know what socioeconomic demographic are these people coming from right. what age group you know what how's right. all of that stuff physical activity levels so always ask yourself how else can we explain these conclusions and um the less alternative hypotheses you can come up with Maybe the stronger the conclusion, that's kind of like a very right. subjective thing, but, uh, you know, this is, this is really, really good. And along those same lines, if, if we're looking at a conclusion of an article, how do we know whether or not it's relatively safe to apply to our own diet and training? If we've matched up the demographic and now we go to the conclusion. So I think, um, one thing to first consider, and this is going back to that uh, sort of meta theme, meta topic, is if you are reading an article about like, I don't know, specific grip for your deadlift or something like that, and you're doing all this research and you're like, oh, should I put my thumb on this side or should I, you know, do this? And you're not getting the fundamentals right, it isn't going to matter. If it's something that small and that detailed, I think if you have confidence in the paper, the population matches you or the person you're trying to apply it to, it seems like they have a good number of subjects. You can't think of very many alternative conclusions that aren't ridiculous um, looking at their data. Then at that point, if it's a detail, try it. Because there's going to be variability. Any of these things, there's going to be a little bit of individual variability. And if you're trying to apply it to you or a population, it's not dangerous. It's just a detail and you feel confident about it. Try it. See what happens. So that's where a case study becomes really valuable because the only actual result that matters is yours or the person that you're training or helping out, right? So at some point, you just have to do your own experimentation. But do that once you feel very confident in the conclusion that you've from the literature and you're and you're dialing in the, the fundamentals like you said you've got all that dialed in and then you can start right. to play around with stuff no that's right that's, don't worry about like how many grams of creatine you're taking a day <laughs> if you don't eat protein or train right so. yeah 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 um somebody was giving me shit for microwaving my um plastic <laughs> containers the other day oh God. um you call yourself an athlete and uh, yeah well you know it's probably not the healthiest thing to do but then i looked over at what they were eating, and then I just, you know, felt better about myself. So I said, I'll take my plastic toxins. <laughs> you probably snatch more than they do too, right? Yeah. Nice. Um, what were we talking about? Uh, BPA. I was just saying that the place you get the most BPA exposure is in the hospital. Is that right? Mm. So they're not worried about it. <laughs> Unbelievable. That's uh, Thank you for that. Man. There you Science. go. <laughs> I'm putting that on a post-it on my... Plastic containers that I throw in the microwave. I'll just put it on the microwave. Um, I I love that. I think 
this conversation is not just f- for the listeners. You know, we're not just talking to people who are who have no scientific background because we talk about this in the clinical athlete forum with students and clinicians because we don't get our DPT program. Like we're doctorates here. Like I have a, that DBT, but that's not a that's not a, a, a research doctorate. And we don't get a ton. It's a clinical doctorate. We don't get a ton of experience or or forced to read research. We have a couple research classes and then it's really like kind of a unwritten rule. Oh, you should be evidence-based, but it's, they don't necessarily teach you how to really analyze those things. And I think it just takes a lot of practice. Like you, I love that point that you made, Mel, is like, you need to set aside some time. Yeah. If you, yeah, you don't just, you're not just going to gloss over this thing while you're watching football and get, something out of a research article you've got to go back and forth and back and forth and by the time you're out of the method you're like oh thank god that's over and then you start reading the results and then you're like oh wait how did they do that or what was the outcome measure and then you got to go back up to the methods and it, you're, yeah like you said you're reading the, the research article two or three times before you feel like you have a comfortable grasp on what's going on to even really talk about it so just keep that in mind guys you know this is this applies to everyone um, all of us included too and i think that's a nice segue to goals so we talk about applying science and research to your own diet and training and then it's like okay now how do i set up my plan and it's it's new year's now it's 2019 everybody's got their plan what is what are the main issues with things like new year's resolutions when it comes to the i'm going to say the science of goal setting because i think there is some some stuff there Um, where do do you see with that? Yeah. So I think this comes back to my meta topic and diving in. Uh, so there's a little bit, I want to say that willpower is finite and there's a little bit of controversy in the psychological literature about that. But I think what there is a consensus on is that there's a fine, finite amount of willpower that you will apply to non-urgent goals, right? If you are, um, being chased by a tiger, the amount of willpower you have to continue running might be higher than if you're just trying to lose weight. But in terms of adding things to your life, um, things like losing weight or adding a training regimen, things like that, you are tapping into this sort of finite resource of focus and motivation. So I think the absolute worst thing that people can do coming into their New Year's resolution is to make this just overarching lifestyle change goal. like you are currently 50 pounds overweight and have never exercised and your plan is to, you know, lose 50 pounds and run a marathon and like start weightlifting. That kind of change is just not going to happen. There's almost no one that can make that kind of huge change and have it be sustainable. So I think the most important thing to do when coming into New Year's is take a very small, tiny chunk of your overall goal and just make that the goal. And get there and maintain it. And um, there's some research to suggest that changes like this in terms of like lifestyle take six months to a year to be sort of set. So if your goal is just to be healthier, take a small chunk of that. Like I'm going to eat protein four times a day and I'm only going to go out to eat once a week, something like that. Do that for six months and then start the next phase of your goal because you can get real excited about losing a bunch of weight and getting in shape, but the chances that you do it and sustain it in a small amount of time are really small. So getting, um, setting yourself on a path to take little tiny baby steps over several years to get where you want to get is, um, will make you 90% more likely to get there at some point in your life. So that's my, my biggest, biggest message, but I have some, I have some other stuff to say. I'll <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, that's I love that. That I wanted to think about that for a second. If your recommendation to somebody was, I want you to eat protein this many times a day for the next six months, and then we'll talk about something else. Can you imagine? Yeah. Like that is such a hard. The, and the problem is, it's such a hard sell for people because they don't understand that 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 takes change. Like we're talking about habits here, and yeah. your example was like, well, I want to, oh, I want to lose a hundred pounds. I want to be an Olympian, and I want to learn three new sports. Um, in six months. And if, if we're like, okay, behavior is like habit change. Basically you're trying to change the habit of your life. You're trying to have a new life as a habit and it just doesn't work like that. Um, you want to stop biting your nails? 
you know, put some nail polish on your nails and, and put them in your pockets and then let's do that for a, a while. I, no, I, I think that's awesome. Would you say that finite nature of willpower is synonymous with something that a term that I have heard called decision fatigue that kind of happens over the course? Have you heard that before? I have. I don't think it's synonymous, but I think it's okay. related. It's um, it's sort of a similar issue when there's only so much uh, stress, and any kind of change is stress. Any kind of decision making is involves stress. There's only so much stress any individual can handle before they just stop doing one of the things that's causing them stress. So, the more the more you have going on in your life already, the less you should add in terms of your New Year's resolution for change. So, with the finite nature of willpower. It's more of a, this is more of a global topic in regards to like how much willpower. Okay. Yeah. That, yeah. How much, how much can you handle? How much stress can you handle? I think that with these topics, there's definitely some parallels in the rehab world. Um, we just talked about how, uh, you know, if we're discussing habit formation and creating a reasonable plan to, to form the habits that we want or break the habits that we don't want anymore, that's not usually a sexy conversation to have. And Quinn, maybe you could speak to this. Uh, I can think of a lot of instances where someone comes in, they've got some sort of pain or issue and they want to get rid of that. They want to add 50 pounds to their total and I don't know something else in black belt. That, I, get, get their black belt in, <laughs> in jiu-jitsu yeah, yeah exactly and, and and then the conversation often ends up having to be like okay these are awesome let's pump the brakes a bit let's just do these two things half decently or really well for like the next three to four months because that's what we know takes or that's roughly how long we, we know uh it's going to take to make some substantial improvements in this particular thing it's affecting you and then we can go into the next thing um i, I know that i've gotten a bunch of responses that have been like well that, that sucks i don't like that i'm gonna go to the next guy down the street right. and at which point i kind of throw up my hands be like that's i understand I, I know this is not a fun conversation at all but this is why i'm saying what what i'm saying and this is why i think it's the best way to go what we ultimately do is kind of up to you right yeah well do you have any tips for how people start setting their goals specific to them. Like what's, what's a, you know, reference points in regards to self-assessment that would even would be good goals that would actually change something. I think I'll use an example of weight loss because it's really common and pretty easy to think about. So I think you can look at weight loss and you can sort of look at the range of healthy paces. So for example, let's say, zero to 1.5% of your body weight per week is a healthy range to lose weight. Oh, zeros above, slightly above zero. So I think the more overweight you are and the longer you have not had any of these healthy eating habits and not tried to diet, the slower you should kind of go. I think that if you have a history of being overweight for years, then start off in the middle or below the middle of the pace and like below the middle of the maximal loss you can get. The tendency is the more overweight you are, the more you want to lose as fast as you can. But the truth is the more overweight you are, the bigger habits you have to change. So doing the amount of willpower it takes to make a huge change and be losing maximum weight every single week is it's going to take over your life. Something else is going to slip. And most likely what's going to end up flipping is the diet because that's new. So I think taking a look at the thing that you want to change and thinking about how long have you, how long have you been not doing that and how far away from doing that have you been and the longer and the further, the less of a big, the less of a large change you should, you should make. So if you're, for example, really fit, you exercise regularly, you eat pretty well and you just like, you want to have abs, fine. Go for it. Go hard. Do the hard diet. You already ha are using your willpower to execute all the other things in your life. And just taking it up a notch isn't going to be an overriding problem for you. But if your lifestyle is the opposite of what you're looking to make it, you need to sort of dip your feet in slowly. Does that answer your question? Or did I go off on a tangent? No, it totally does. It's, it goes back to your analogy with the whole, like, should I, f should I change my grip or widen my grip in the deadlift versus right. do I even know what a deadlift is? Right. Uh, yeah. So uh, when you're giving goals for, let's say, nutrition, for example, do you have tendencies 
to give them something to add and something to take away. Like, for example, you said, I want you to eat protein this many times a day. And I also only want you to go out to eat this many times a day. Or like, do you have those types of things that you give to people as kind of like couplets or something like that? Uh, not as often. Usually, A lot of the people I work with have already been into sort of diet and fitness a lot. I haven't worked with that many complete beginners. When I do work with a beginner, I tend to do more of that. So just, you know, what are the things that you do that are counterproductive to your goal? Let's take half of those away and replace them with healthy behaviors, but let's not take them all away yet until you get used to the healthy behaviors that are sprinkled into your routine right now. Do you find the same with performance? Are you... Is there is there a balance like with your clients now that are pretty good in regards to their nutrition and performance? Do you have them structure their performance goals and nutrition goals differently from just a conceptual standpoint? Or are they are they kind of both going at the same time? Like we have we have our performance goal goals here, we have our nutrition goals, and we have kind of each from each category at ongoing. Yeah. So you, I mean, for a lot of my clients, it's both and they're both structured towards the same thing. So for example, like a lot of clients will come and be like, Oh, I'm, you know, I want to run a marathon and add like 25 pounds to my total and like lose weight in the next three months. And you're like, okay, let's step back. You know, there's some things we can do at the same time as others and others that we can't, like, you're not going to train for a marathon and add 25 pounds to your total. You're not going to add 25 pounds to your total while you're losing weight for three months, things like that. So sort of giving them an understanding of like what of their goals are actually counterproductive and will have to be done in separate phases and what of their goals can be overlapped and worked on together. Does that make sense? Totally. I think that's huge. I don't think that people quite understand that some things are direct competitors of other things in regards to like what you're trying to change. No, no, I think that that makes perfect sense. Again, we're just setting expectations, which we've talked about before on on previous podcasts and in other uh, other forms that that's huge, especially from the outset, because it probably avoids um, big headaches for for us as practitioners or coaches. Uh, and then our clients, because we've taken the time to say, this is what we can likely expect if we go down this road. And this is probably how we get the most bang for our buck. And then if the the client buys into that, you know, we're, we're probably good. But if they if we start off and they think that they can have it all and they can't, then, you know, we're the bad guys. We, we haven't delivered on what they've hired us to do. Or that's the perception anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's something that happens a lot. And personally, as a coach, it's something that took me a long time to deal with. So I'd spend, you know, emails and emails trying to convince people of the truth (laughs) of something like that. Like these goals, this can't happen in this amount of time, but here's how it can happen. And and the ones that won't believe that, ah, you just kind of have to let it go. You do your best to, you know, transmit the information and help them understand. And if they still choose fantasy, then. (laughs) Well, because we've got, we've got finite willpower too. As coaches, you know, you, we can't. The clients who are going to listen. It's, it's tough to have a, a client who is difficult and then, then, and then to have to manage your other ones in, with the same vigor. It, you know, right. like it drains you a little bit. And yeah, we did talk about this on a separate episode that we can't, you're not going to save everyone. And that sometimes right. people will come back. Mel, you've probably experienced this where somebody's like, you know what, I'm going to go a different direction. And then they, down the line, they end up coming back to you and saying, you know what? I want to try it. You were, you were kind of right. This didn't work. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, your background is so interesting to me because of what you, where your PhDs lie and in the, in the realm of human behavior. Can you talk a little bit about that, how that's important with goal setting with things like locus of control, um, people accepting, you know, their successes and failures, that, that type of thing. Yeah, so something that I find really interesting is that all all of the things I sort of learned about human behavior with respect to learning or change or goal setting applies perfectly to diet and training. So one of the biggest things that we've shown in the literature for any kind of change, it's just like across all possible um, life changes you can make, is that 
if the individual is making the chain because they want to be perceived differently or because someone else wants them to make the change or because they think they're supposed to, their likelihood of failure is infinitely higher. So before you decide your goal, a good thing to do, and it sounds kind of silly and fuzzy, is to like look inside and really think about, like, is this something that I want for me? Why am I actually doing this? What do I actually want? And when you identify the thing that you want for you and not because you want people to see you a certain way or you think you'll be more respected, just that you want, your likelihood of success is a lot higher. So a lot of people sort of you get, at least I get clients who aren't sure if they want to gain muscle or lose fat or get stronger or just look better. And they just don't know. They have all of these sort of conflicting goals floating around. It's hard to chase that many conflicting goals because there's different processes for each one. So really identifying the thing that you want, one single individual thing at a time, working towards it can improve your chances of success. Um, and in terms of internal, external locus of control, it's sort of related. If every failure you have, you blame on yourself. That means you also get to claim every success. So a lot of people will go into a diet, and every time there's an obstacle, they'll tell you like what happened and how they couldn't follow the diet because of it. Whereas someone with an internal locus of control will say, ah, I made a mistake. When I traveled, I didn't pack food. I didn't look up restaurants. I didn't get, you know, an Airbnb or a hotel that had a refrigerator and a stove so that I could continue on my diet. I need to fix this next time. They did some one-time mistake, and they get better every time. So that's another thing I think that contributes um, really highly to success. Uh, a third thing. Oh, sorry. I'll no, no, no. Go. No, no, no. You're, you're rolling. <laughs> no, a third thing I think is. Um, Social support has been shown to tremendously improve people's chances of success. Um, and I think a lot of people who are dieting in particular don't like to tell people they're on a diet. They're afraid they're going to fail. They're afraid they'll be judged. They don't want to seem like that girl who just eats salad, especially for the women and the guys, maybe even more. They don't want to be that guy. But telling people what you're doing and like asking for their support is something that can really make the chances of doing well improve. Can you shift? Uh, you can you can shift people from. Let's say you have a client who is in that mindset of "woe is me." It's it, you know, it's right. excuse. Everything is everything is external. What are your strategies as a coach to start to chip away? Do you take the whole? You just throw them a three-page email of like, "This is why you're fucking <laughs> up," and like, get your shit together, and this, you know. Or do you chip away at it over time and do you have specific strategies at that or is it just kind of a patience thing? Yeah, I think you can chip away at it because you don't want to, someone who's already sort of woe is me and you just sort of crap all over them. They tend to, to just want to give up. So I think um, one thing is a strategy, a psychological strategy called um, intention implementation. So you can teach them these sort of if then phrases. So if I have to travel, I will plan for it and pack food. If I go to my mother-in-law's house, I will tell her I'm on a diet and I will bring my food. This kind of thing so that give them a strategy to correct and then also point out to them like, I see you're blaming this on, you know, the work dinner, but let's talk about what you could have done to minimize the impact instead of, you know, going all out on the buffet and having four margaritas. <laughs> but they're done differently to minimize, if not eliminate the impact. So start with minimize, get to eliminate later. So your, I love that. Your strategy is take, if, if they're giving you excuses, you as a coach can use that as an opportunity to educate. It's like that excuse can be flipped right back into an if-then statement, and now it's into mm -hmm. a, a strategy for success. And would you say it's also safe as a coach, clinician, whatever, to be ready to repeat yourself ad nauseum <laughs> and as if it's the first time you said it? So like yeah. that if then statement is awesome. It's, it's going to be a great solution, but be ready to repeat it over and over and over and over again. Absolutely. I think like just like reading a scientific paper, you don't get it the first time through. 
they're not going to get a whole like psychological life changing strategy the first time through. So if they continually hear ways that they could have avoided the catastrophe that they're presenting to you as impossible, then eventually I think for most people it, it gets through and they start trying to structure their perception of those events around that improved sort of idea. Have you implemented these strategies? I probably know the answer here, but for yourself, I mean, you're very, you have well-rounded two PhDs, a black belt, compete at a high level and you do all these things. Are you structuring? Are you thinking long-term? Well, it's, it's January 1st, you know, a few days ago, what does Mel do? Does she plan out 2019? What are your strategies? Um, <laughs> so yeah, so for this year, I made a small goal for myself and that was to train jujitsu more regularly. I was doing pretty well in 2018, but it was sort of, uh, I had a sort of monthly goal of number of hours to train. And for 2019, I'm doing more of a specific daily goal. Like this, these specific classes at these specific times are the ones that I will always attend no matter what. And I've, my lifting was more of a, okay, you have, you know, these four days of lifting to get in in the week and each one has like a fudge factor day. But now I'm setting up 2019, like, no, your leg day is going to be, you know, Monday at 11 and your deadlift day is going to be this day at this time so that I don't, because I found myself slipping a little bit. I had like more variability than I would like in my lifting and jujitsu training. And I'd like to take that out. That seems parallel with, well, I'll read like uh, time management books and stuff like that. And they're like, the traditional thought is to make lists for your tasks. But lists mean nothing if they're just literally tasks. What the yeah. recommendation is, time it. No, I'm going to do this task at this time and have a time chunk. And you, and then you actually plan your variable time. I'm, I actually want my time to be variable from this time to this time. That, that sounds like that's kind of the transition that you made is yeah. my goal is to, go to more, be more consistent with jujitsu. That's a, that's a good concept, but that's not right. an actionable goal. But when, when do you go to more jujitsu classes? How, what does that look like? And so your recommendation is plan it specifically every, like literally imagine yourself the time, the day, if you have to say, I'm going to wear my red shirt uh, and you put your shoes by the front door, you know, anything that you have to do to prepare for getting that thing done. Um, yeah. On the topic of this, um, not only writing the time for the thing to do, but the specific, like if it's something like mail this package, instead of just saying mail this package, say drive to this location and send this package at this time. And it, for some reason, having that extra element of detail makes the task less uh, ominous. So when you're just thinking about this thing I have to do, it's sort of, you haven't gotten to the first step in your mind and it seems like a bigger deal than it is. But when you outline the first step, the first action you have to do to get that plan in motion, it makes it more digestible sort of for your brain. Yeah, I love that. And with training, I imagine it would be very, very similar, but it, it goes back to all the points you've said. If we're just bringing this home, you can break it down so to such small details in a good way. You've got small goals, you've got small habit changes. You can take those habit changes, eat protein four times a day. What protein? What times during the day am I going to eat? Um, right. Am I going to put what containers? Is it going to be in this container? I'm going to put them all Tupperware. in the fridge for two. Yeah, yeah. My plastic Tupperware. Um, it, just make it set yourself up for success. And I think uh, make the degree of structure that you're adding a small step from whatever your previous structure was. Because if I gave myself the plan that I've given myself for 2019 five years ago, it probably would fail miserably. Because then it was just like, I just need to, you know, get into jiu-jitsu like five times a week and I'll be good. <laughs> and I think starting with something like that is great. And then once that is set, you can move up to more and more structured 
um, versions of your plan, which will get you more and more results, but it's an easing in type of thing. Or if I want to get better at reading research, okay, my goal is to read more research this year. Well, that it's going to last about a week. You're gonna, yeah. Right. So what's what research? What's the question? Is it going to be different research articles each week or is it going to be the same one? Maybe you read the same one twice a week or something like that. So, yeah, your your point is get specific with your goals and make them manageable and right. and stick with that specific thing for a while. Just because you get it done for a week, don't pat yourself on the back and then move on to the next next level necessarily. I mean, you can, but just be patient with yeah. the process. When it becomes very comfortable, then add to it. I love it. Jared, you got anything to add? No, I'm just, I'm enjoying it too. Making notes for myself. <laughs> Mel, um, anything we didn't cover there? That, or are you going to save the uh, rest of your points for the I webinar? Think we, I think we touched on all the main points. So we'll get into a lot more detail on the webinar. Cool. The webinar is in about a week well this show hopefully will go out here pretty soon but um it's it's going to be up in the forum regardless and we'll we'll be making posts about it from now january 10th is the date mm -hmm. and um if you register you always get the recording so you know don't freak out if you can't make the time you know, we will send you the recording mel is going to cover this stuff and and much more and then have a um she'll have a reference list there so there there you go a webinar about appraising literature with a reference list um, there's your first bout of, of practice right there. Mel, thanks so much. Where can people connect with you? Where can they find you? Learn about everything that you're doing. Um, so you can find me at RP or um, I guess I'm on Instagram, but right now my Instagram is pictures of cats and places I travel. I'm working on setting up a, sort of a more professional Instagram. By professional, I mean fitness memes and a bunch of BS, but more <laughs> than talking about. Um, but maybe I'll throw that into the end of the webinar because I don't have it set up yet. That's totally fine. Listen, cats are cool too. <laughs> They're kind of shitheads sometimes. I grew up with cats. I can say this, but, um, <laughs> yeah, and the, yeah, and there it is. Yeah. If you can see, we've got a video. That's, that's a, that's a pretty stout looking cat there. <laughs> a big boy but yeah my personal instagram is rp underscore doctor dr underscore mel melgram really easy to remember mel melgram well, well we, we we'll be sharing you and, and tagging you all over the place so you guys can just go to our page if anything else and, and and then find you and then with rp on the rp website as well um that's where your all your services and, and coaching and, and consulting can be found as well yeah okay Renaissance periodization. Awesome. Thanks so much again for being on the show. We're looking forward to the, yeah, we're looking forward to the webinar and uh, we'll catch you guys next time.